God, these are hard to watch. Oh, the quads. I'm going to get sick watching this. What's going on, guys? It's Bromley, and I did it. I caved in. We're finally going to do a reaction video. I fought this for a very long time, but I thought this particular topic, there was a good opportunity to maybe shed some light on some things that don't get discussed. These are gruesome weightlifting injury videos, and usually it's just spread around for shock value. I'm going to get into a little bit of why I think they happen, the likelihood that it's going to happen to you, things you can do to prevent it, stuff like that. And this was actually a question from one of our Patreon members. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to make it a little educational. So I'm not going to talk about the most common issues, the smaller ones. Uh, these are the, the gruesome ones, the dramatic ones. So I'm going to cover the big three. The things that I think are the most common when it comes to these injuries are bicep tears, pectoral tears, and quadricep tears. That's not to say that they're the only ones. Uh, there usually aren't a lot of other muscles that just fly off the bone the way these do. Now, there's a subtle difference. Muscle tears happen more in the muscle belly, and that's where you see the most bruising. If you see somebody who has a lot of bruising, a lot of purple and blue all over their body, that's because the muscle tore, because that's where a ton of blood vessels are. Muscles are just saturated with blood, and it's one of the ways in which they can recover so fast. Whereas tendons take longer to heal than some bone breaks, because they're very stiff, very rigid, and they don't have a, a wide blood supply. Uh, when tendons pull up, they actually can be attached further down. When muscles tear, from the description that I heard, is it's like trying to suture a hamburger. You can't exactly repair a muscle when it tears. So little ones don't tend to be that big of a deal because they heal pretty quickly. Bigger ones can end careers. So let's go over the first run. We're gonna st we're gonna start with least gruesome and go to most. And I think the least gruesome and also one of the most common are bicep ruptures. I'm not gonna include the fucking around injuries, which usually have to do with things like curls. Joey Satmary was doing some stupid stuff with Juji Mufu and, and one of the other YouTube guys, and he thought it'd be a good idea to do a max preacher curl. Uh, the bicep is not a power muscle. Now we like to pay a lot of attention to the bicep because of how it looks. Functionally, big biceps don't do a whole lot. It's not a power movement. In fact, if you look at the musculature of the bicep in most animals, I remember dissecting cats in physiology, the bicep is a nothing muscle. It does the, the little job of flexing the elbow, and that's not something that generally has to uh, include a lot of force production. So even when doing things like chin-ups, even looking at like orangutans hanging from trees or, or something, uh, you don't see these very big overdeveloped biceps. Now, the nature of the bicep, the way it attaches, because it runs down this way, as you strain the elbow, it flies loose pretty easily when it's under load. So the things that tend to take it the most often, reckless curls, and in strongman, things like axle cleans, which I hate, and tire flips, which I hate, mainly for that, that reason. That tends to be the limiting factor at the top. You see guys just attach their biceps left and right. In powerlifting, it's probably the most common because of the mixed grip, the fact that double overhand, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody tearing a bicep. So the mixed grip, if you are not keeping your elbow straight, or worse yet, God, if you are trying to row, you'll see guys flex their elbow on a really sticky deadlift. You're just asking for trouble. And that's evident by that's evident by this, by the fact that on these really heavy deadlifts, man, right here, you see that arm stretch, you see him fighting, and you can just see how much tension that bicep was under. And man, that guy just toughed it out. Holy crap. I'll speak from experience because I've had little pec tears. I haven't had a quad tear, you know, knock on wood. I did roll my bicep up on a tire flip, uh, which is why I will literally never flip a tire ever again. We have a little 600 pound tire that some of our, our novices can flip. I don't like moving that tire because of the position it puts my bicep in. I will say that when the tendon goes, and it, this is different for different body parts, it doesn't tend to hurt as much. I've heard some are painful. The bicep was not painful. and it, It's more surprising and jarring than anything. But you'll see these guys, they'll feel it go, but their grip is still intact. So they'll just lock the, the lift out because you, you brought it this far. You might as well get white lights, right? Um, oh, man, that went right off the ground. And you could even see. And he sets it down carefully, and he's kind of smiling. He's mad right there because he didn't get the down command. <laughs> and he jumped the down command. He thought he toughed it out. And he's, trying, he's like, what's wrong with my bicep? I didn't get the lift. I think it grosses people out more than anything when they feel it. Hey, guys, if any of this was helpful, please hit the like and subscribe button. Go ahead and check out Base Strength and Peak Strength. Those are both available on my store. You can pick up some merch or they're available on Amazon. Thank you guys for your support. It's been huge. Now, this is my uh, tire flip. This is actually where I tore my bicep. And... I had about a 600 pound tire, which for a tire isn't very heavy. And 
I had my buddy who was 6'4", weighs 360 pounds, at least in this video he did. And it, it brought it to well over 900 pounds. It's pretty heavy for a tire, a legit. You'll have people call their tires 900 pounds for days. It never is. See Alan Thrall's video on that. Uh, but 900 pounds is legitimately heavy. I did two good flips, and his wife pulled out the phone. And I was like, all right, the, let's do it for the gram. And I put a little extra mustard into it. And right as I extended, again, you have that arm. You're supinated. The biceps stressed. And right as I extended my hip. Oh, mother. That jerk just yanked the tendon right up. And it was one of those things. I knew they couldn't do anything. They were, if I went to urgent care, you know, they were going to tell me to take ibuprofen and stop lifting. So we just went to Cheesecake Factory after that. It healed on its own. It took about, I used BPC, which is a godsend for tendon ruptures. Uh, it took about four weeks to heal, which is insanely fast for anything tendon. And I actually did a strongman contest a week later. It's a little weak. Uh, it, it gives me some shoulder issues because I'm a little unstable right here. I didn't get it reattached. Mine wasn't a full rupture. I figured it would heal eventually on its own and I would just limit the things that put stress on it. Some guys get full ruptures and they have to get it reattached or you just walk around with you know, this bulge up here and you understand that your arm is just never going to be quite as strong. I kind of lucked out because mine didn't take that much, uh, that much intervention to heal. The big thing is if you're going to do mixed grip, Make damn sure that that bar is hanging. I mean, you can lock your lats in, but don't ever try to row it over your knees. Don't ever try to pull with that elbow in that position. An underhand position is extraordinarily weak. Rows are a different story if you're doing strict bent over rows because you're focusing on dragging at the elbow. It's when you're standing up and that elbow is close to being locked out. That's where all the pressure is and that's where it ruptures. Now, even though it doesn't look like these were all the biggest juice heads you know, Gear is absolutely a factor. It really is. I don't know a lot of people that I would say conclusively are natty. I mean, how many people do you know are natty? But just from people talking, experiences, people will talk about how they got injured and they will talk about where they were in their cycle. And almost always it's when somebody's ramping up for a big meet, the dose goes up, you get things that lay down muscle tissue really fast, or you get things that, that tighten you up, bound you up, or you take things that dry you out. And all of these things cause those structures to either rupture more easily or to be a little more brittle or to not be quite as secure. So there is absolutely a correlation between guys jacking up the amount of gear they're on and things popping. Nowadays, it's just, it's so common. People don't bat an eye. This is one of the reasons I hate the deadlift as a grip exercise. Straps, I think, should be part of the movement because it's the risk to the lifter and it's also the fact that a deadlift is not a test of grip strength. It shouldn't be. It's really never been seen that way. So the fact that powerlifting has that in the rules is arbitrary. Strongmen use straps, bodybuilders use straps, Olympic lifters when they deadlift use straps. Functionally, the deadlift is best with straps. I think that's how it should be tested. I think turning it into a grip exercise is not just dumb because that's the ultimate limiting factor if you absolutely top your ability out but it's also the risk to the lifter. There's no good way to hold a barbell that doesn't put your bicep at risk. So I see it as a stupid test of strength. That's just me. All right, next most gruesome. God, these are hard to watch. Oh, the pec tear ones, Jesus. So uh, I don't know most of these people's names, but this guy was training with Larry Wheels. This one went uh, <laughs> went viral pretty quick. Uh, he was wearing this, this muscle tee and you could see his entire pec yank up and there's a similar dynamic at play with the bicep and the pec, and that's how it attaches and how much tension it's under when the joint is, is completely extended. I think more common is that the actual pec detaches, and that's a problem because if you tear tendons, tendons can be pulled down and reattached. If you pull the muscle from the tendon, you're screwed. You can't do anything. And because you have this lump, this is all muscle tissue right here. And if you get wear over time, you get a seam and that seam opens up all at once. We had a member of our gym, Philip Morris, who was well into the 600s for a bench press. Dude was like a human forklift. And he ripped the shit out of his pec from the muscle doing reps with 405. And it, it goes back to what I was talking about. If you're, if you're laying down muscle, this is a bro theory, I have as a hypothesis, but if you're laying down muscle tissue too fast, uh, I think that structurally, it's not adapted to the work. So if you gain five pounds of muscle in a year, it's gonna be tempered to what you do day in and day out in your workouts. If you lay down five pounds of muscle in three weeks, it's not, it's only had a couple workouts. It's not built as a byproduct of the stress. It's not an adaptation. These injuries have ended the careers of a lot of people. Bill Kazmaier ripped the, the muscle doing a uh, doing a, 
a steel bar bend at World's Strongest Man. And according to him, I sat in a seminar that he gave about 15 years ago and he talked about how they changed it to like cold roll steel or something that had higher tensile strength. So all these guys are just in this stretched out pigeon wing where again, you have all the stress right here and they're cranking down. It's something like a max effort fly. That's almost what it looks like. 1981. And listen to Casmo. Oh. And it ended his his, uh, his career. He went from being a mid to high 600 pound bencher. Uh, I heard that he got into the low fives after that, but that was devastating for him. No dicking around, guys. No bouncing the bar off your chest. You need control. You need to use the compression in your lats. You need to figure out how to use your front delts and load the triceps and build up compression. So you're not just flaring your elbows and turning your pec into a trampoline. Because again, just like the bicep, if that's what you're doing, if you're trying to exploit the tension from your pec being stretched all the way, okay, you might have strong pecs, you might get away with it for a while, but that's gonna cause more shoulder problems. Eventually, the likelihood of a pec tear is gonna happen. I had this happen to me in high school. My first 300 pound bench press attempt, I was 16 and I got a 295 and I saw this other guy who was a very explosive bencher hit a 300. I wanted to do 300. So I'm like, oh, I'll just bounce like he does. Dupe came up. Couldn't bench press for four months after that. And to this day, I can still feel the scar tissue. That was my first muscle injury. And actually, yeah, that was Natty. I was 16. So it can happen if you're reckless. It can happen. It was a little tear, but I remember it it swelled up so much. It was horrible. It was nothing like this, though. And what stands out to me when I see these guys is the culture they're in as far as the way they train. Oh, good God. They're all very physique oriented. They're all probably very liberal with gear use. Look guys, if you don't know, if you don't train in these circles, gear use is the most normal thing in the world in lifting. It's all the guys that are amateurs or new or don't, don't know a lot of people in the field that don't know that. It's once you get into competing or hanging out with these personality types, it is so normal. It's like cocaine at a Hollywood party. It's just the most normal thing in the world. So these guys try to, to level their physique up and this is what they end up doing. They end up getting too big too fast. So I have my hypothesis about laying down tissue too fast. Uh, there are things that make you too strong too quick. Uh, trend balloon's a good example. It makes you stronger faster than you can physically grow muscle. It's literally within a few days, your nervous system starts liberating all of this force production. It's like taking the governor off. So with the same amount of muscle tissue, you're actually allowing yourself to uh, use more of it, to apply more force. And all of a sudden your structures, your tendons, your joints, everything, that supports that force production is now having to handle these heavier loads and this greater intensity throughout the entire workout, throughout all of these movements, not just the main ones, every accessory movement you do, every supplemental movement you do. And you end up accruing wear very fast and it takes a long time for tendons to adapt. So that's very common where guys get too strong too quick. And it usually happens about halfway up. That's the interesting thing. It's, it's almost never at the bottom. And I think again, because you have all this compression, at the bottom, you have all of this, uh, the, the upper arm running into the lap. You have everything's compressed. The elbow's compressed. The triceps pulled tight. The front delt is pulled tight at the bottom. So that's adding all of this extra pressure. It's once that compression gets released, you're about halfway up. And that's where all of the stress is on the pec. If that elbow comes out to the side, this is where the tension built right across that band right there is isolated almost completely on the pec. If your elbows are tucked, if you're using your front delt to, to kind of move up and back like a lot of people do, it's not going to be as much. I don't think you see this injury from, from those types of benchers as often. It's when that elbow flares out right here, you're almost in a pec fly position. That's where all that pressure gets taken out and that's where it, it's likely to happen. I think there's a reason this tends to happen in meets more than training and it's because of how guys will run their gear regimen up going into it. So now we go into the most gruesome ones. Holy hell. God, these are hard to watch. Oh, the quads. I'm going to get sick watching this. Thank God I haven't had a, a quad injury. I had bad patellar tendonitis for the last couple of years. And I was just terrified, terrified that something was going to pop. And it's not just because it would put me out or it would make living impossible until it healed. I mean, that'd be a year probably before I could squat or deadlift or, or do anything to the capacity I'm used to doing it at. And I was terrified of that. But it's, it's just, it's such a gross injury. I mean, when I said the bicep didn't hurt, the bicep is not very big. It's a small muscle. The quads are huge. And when those muscles go, or when those tendons go, that's a painful surgery. That's agonizing pain. I mean, I can only imagine what that feels like. So over here you have 
And I think this tends to happen more with narrow squatters, guys that push into their knees a lot more because that puts a lot of tension right on the quads. And there's a type of squatter, I think it's a lot of wrapped squatters, probably has something to do with how the wraps crank down on the kneecap and don't allow motion. And it's, it's guys that are great in wraps. Those are the guys that are great at building up tension. I remember talking to Sam Bird who squatted like this. He was like a 900 pound squatter at 220 in wraps. And he talked about the tension he would build up. And there's all kinds of techniques you do to squeeze your glutes and squeeze your quads and turn your feet into the ground so that as you push your knees forward into the wraps, you get an insane amount of compression. And again, it's that artificial mechanical tension that is responsible for getting you up and out of the hole. And I think that's where shit tends to go sideways here. So this guy's kind of built like me, short legs, long torso, stays pretty upright and pushes his knees forward. And he had a good run at 838. And then he goes in, tries to hit 400 kilos. And the pop here is just, it's so gross. But you hear it go, if it goes in one, it'll probably go in both because all of a sudden that second leg has to take in all of the, all of the tension. <laughs> I'm screaming god that was hard to watch and then this was another famous one this one's this one's famous because of just how absolutely sickening the pop was what? 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 holy hell and you could see them both go um god that was rough um yeah so with that one you're talking about uh similar mechanics you're talking about so much stretch being pulled over down through the quad over and down in front of the knee that as you're building up that compression and you have this immense load, something goes. Again, probably an accruing of issues, uh, you know, stress is cumulative. So if you're being torn down a little more than you're recovering or that you're building back up, eventually something gives, especially as the training and the gear and everything else, your just pure will keeps you going as certain structures start to deteriorate a, a little bit. And that's where that becomes possible. Though quad tears like that are extremely rare. And I would bet money that 99% of them are all from heavy, heavy reliance on drugs and and going into a meet. I mean, that that's the thing. It's getting ready. It's going that big blast. But when you're this far away from that record, you're this far away from leveling up and actually being something, that's where guys get reckless. They make stupid decisions, and that's part of it. So to all of you guys squatting, uh, I, like I've never heard of that from an Olympic lifter. And Olympic lifters run run drugs. I mean, obviously they do. If you've seen Icarus, I mean, they, they do, period. But the nature of their movement, again, more mobility and flexibility, more skill and technique development. Uh, they don't max out on these static lifts. They're maxing out on the, the, the clean and the jerk and the snatch, which are... Uh, more dynamic and fluid and they're submaximal by nature they're more speed speed movements so you don't tend to see tendon ruptures and i think it has more to do it might be the type of gear they run i'm not up to date on on how those guys structure it i think it is almost certainly without a doubt a byproduct of the way they train they're more mobile they're more fluid they don't get bound up you can't be an olympic lifter with uh deficiencies in flexibility or with a bunch of scar tissue built up they don't rely on mechanical tension that's counter to what they do and given how strong those guys get i don't think there's any reason to go this alternate route where you turn yourself into a human ball of scar tissue to move a little more weight so i don't know about you guys but my butthole is thoroughly clenched right now i don't know if i'm going to be able to lift uh i got a couple weeks until america's strongest man and now i have all of this in my head as i do my least favorite events so thanks for watching guys this is bromley until next time i'll see you